Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is entitled Preparation for the End Time. And this particular lesson, which is lesson number nine for June 2 of 2018, is entitled End Time Deceptions. That should prove to be interesting. Uh, as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer, and we'd like to ask you to join us as we pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we come closer to talking about events which are of great significance in our day, help us to think about the deceptions that Satan is preparing to foist upon us. We know that he's a master deceiver, and so the only safety is our knowing you and your word so clearly that we cannot be deceived. May that be our experience as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, this lesson, the whole lesson, will focus on the fact that the truth is not with Satan. In fact, he's diametrically opposed to the truth because God is truth, John 14, 16, and all of his kingdom is based on truth. So in order to misrepresent God and oppose God in every possible way, Satan has become the master deceiver. The practice of deception did not begin on this earth, of course. It began in heaven. I think we have some words about that. Kerry? Yes. Leaving his place in the immediate presence of God, Lucifer went forth to diffuse the spirit of discontent among the angels. Working with mysterious secrecy and for a time concealing his real purpose under an appearance of reverence for God, he endeavored to excite dissatisfaction concerning the laws that govern heavenly, heavenly beings, intimating that they impose an unnecessary restraint. Since their natures were holy, he urged that the angels should obey the dictates of their own will. He sought to create sympathy for himself by representing that God had dealt unjustly with him in bestowing supreme honor upon Christ. He claimed that in aspiring to greater power and honor, he was not aiming at self-exaltation, but seeking to secure liberty for all the inhabitants of heaven, that by this means they might attain to a higher state of existence. That's from wow. the Great Controversy, page 495, paragraph 2. That's incredible, isn't it? To think that the devil, standing in the very presence of God, would come up with a scheme like that. Now, if the devil, I mean, if God were really the kind of terrible, evil monster that Satan wants us to think he is, he wouldn't have dared to do such a thing. He would have expected God to zap him right on the spot, but... God being the kind of person he is, why, he is very generous. If God were as Satan had, had made him out to be, Satan wouldn't just fear that, but God would have done that, yeah. wiped out Satan. Well, Revelation 12, 9 tells us that instead, ultimately after causing war in heaven, Satan and his angels were cast down to this earth. And of course, guess what he did as soon as he got here? As soon as there was anybody to tempt, he was busy working on Adam and Eve. But they had a protection. What was their protection? They didn't have to go where he was. Yeah, so Satan was limited to that one tree in the garden. So as long as they stayed away from that tree, they were protected. So the tree of knowledge of good and evil was not a way for Adam and Eve to be tempted, although it turned out to be that. It was supposed to be a way to protect them. God just says, stay away from this tree and you'll be fine. Well, you know, most of Christianity doesn't view the tree that way. Not at all. Not at all. Most Seventh-day Adventists don't view it that way. No. Well, as we know, Satan has deceived and, and, and done everything he possibly can to misrepresent God down through the ages until Jesus himself had some interesting things to say about deception. Dennis? Matthew 24, 5, 11 and 23 to 24. Many men claiming to speak for me will come and say, I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many people. 
then many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perform great miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people, if possible. Uh, the Good News Bible. Translate. Okay, now we need to be very clear. How do we know for sure, if we look up in the sky, how can we know for sure that it's the real Jesus coming? Remember, there's a clue right there in the Bible. And I've heard people say so many strange things that I, I think we need to talk about this as often as we have an opportunity. The Bible says every eye every will see eye. him. Not only that, but that's not a foolproof thing because if you say every eye, you, you don't have a chance to run all over the world to see if every eye is seeing him. You can only know that your eyes are seeing him. But there's another way to know. What's the other way? Fill the heavens. The entire heavens will be full of bright shining angels when the real Jesus shows up. And Ellen White and the Bible both say he will not be able to, to duplicate that manner of coming. So if the heavens are not full of angels, Forget it, it's not the real one. So I, I think that's a pretty simple test. So, so there's only... So it's not just that his feet don't touch the ground. Yeah, no, it's not just that his feet don't touch the ground. And I think those who know him will, will know him. Yeah, when They'll we get to that to point. Be, be able yeah. to discern between good and evil and, and reject, the, reject the evil. Those who will see him coming will be special people. <laughs> yeah. Well, how can we preserve ourselves? How can we protect ourselves against being deceived? Knowing what truth is. Knowing the truth forward and backward, understanding God's nature, His character, His God, how He runs His government. So in light of that... And having a daily experience sure. with Him. Of course. It's, and it's that an would do experiential it. knowledge, not just yeah. uh, head knowledge. Very good. So what are Satan's most effective deceptions? I mean, we should be warned, shouldn't we, if we... Well, it, like most uh, advertising, it targets our weaknesses, mm -hmm. our cherished desires, and, and tries to, to hit us there. Well, strange as it may seem, one of, one of Satan's most effective deceptions is convincing people that he doesn't really exist. Now, that might seem a little strange to us. Why would he want people to think that he doesn't exist? If Satan doesn't exist and some miracle happens, then it has to be God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when a, Satan is able to perform miracles, he can do that claiming to be God. Um, pretty subtle way to do things. So, in light of this, and in light of our understanding of the great controversy, we ask this question, which we need to ask repeatedly, how many people in our world actually understand the great controversy? I'm not talking about all, uh, actual numbers, but... Minority. The, the percentage must be less than 1%. Yeah. Way less than 1%. Uh, do people understand that this is not just a battle between the forces of evil and the forces of good or just generic evil versus generic good? This is a very specific personal attack against God by a very personal being known as Satan or the devil, depending on which language you translate from. So the next question then should, for us should be, if you know your Bible, where would you look to prove that Satan is real? Well, you could Job look would be the first place. I would hmm? go. Job would be... Job 1 and 2 is a great place. The Old Testament, and then also in Matthew, the Gospels, the uh, temptations well, uh, of Jesus. Yeah, who tempted Jesus? And what, uh, Carrie, what did you say? I was, I was going to say the Gospels. Yeah, the Gospels, okay. Yeah. There's demon possession, what's going on there? Uh, and Jesus there's told Peter that he, that Satan had demanded that he be sifted like wheat, but I have prayed for you. So mm -hmm. there's obviously a... You got First Peter 5.8. Yeah. 
It's, it's, I was gonna, goes around like a roaring lion seeking who you may destroy. Yeah. There's one very specific reference in the Old Testament that almost all scholars have to admit. This is, who know the Hebrew, this is talking about a very personal devil. And that's Zechariah 3, 1 to 5, where it talks about the judgment. And who's accusing there? Satan. Who's the one who's accusing the righteous? It's Satan. And who's defending us? It's Jesus. And it's pretty hard to say, well, this that's just a generic evil or something. No, this is a very specific person making accusations against God's true people. So, um, pretty hard to argue against that argument. And you've already... I once, not, not too many years ago, was having to get into a short discussion with someone whose name would be very well recognized as a semi-theologian. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, the devil doesn't really exist. I said, well, what about Job? Well, and what about Zechariah 3? Oh, yeah, you know, it does say that, doesn't it? <laughs> and, you know, so... Yeah. Some yeah. People, yeah. That's a pretty hard, if you know your Hebrew, it's pretty hard to argue against Zechariah 3. Yeah. Well, another really important verse to us, for us to be aware of is, is uh, 2 Corinthians 11, um, where verse 14, Paul says, well, no wonder, even Satan can disguise himself to look like an angel of light. So that should give us fear and trembling, shouldn't it? And there are others, there are lots of references in the book of Revelation that I won't read right now. We'll have a chance to look at some of them as we go along. Um, so the great controversy, we believe, lies behind much, if not all, of Scripture. The idea of the great controversy, what's going on there. If we fail to understand the reality of Satan and his devices, then we're going to miss many of Satan's deceptions. If we believe that he's nothing more than some kind of imaginary character with horns and a tail, nothing more than like a cartoon character, well then we probably won't respect him for what he really is <coughs> and fear him even as we should probably. Well, you know, speaking on that line, I've often thought and said a few times that we need to have more English majors uh, in theology and in Bible discussions. You know, I went through English classes. Well, what's underlying theme? There's nothing there. And yet they come up with something, mm -hmm. you know, and when there is something in the Bible, you know, they should be able to figure it out and talk some more about it. Yeah. Well, Revelation 12, 11 is an important verse. Our brothers and sisters won the victory over him, and it's clearly talking about Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, by the truth which they proclaimed, and they were willing to give up their lives and die. So this is, this is, this is going to be a life and death issue. A life and death issue between God's people and the devil. A um, couple more places. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 and 10. The wicked one will come with the power of Satan and perform all kinds of false miracles and wonders and use every kind of wicked deceit on those who will perish. They will perish because they did not welcome and love the truth so as to be saved. That sounds pretty personal, pretty serious, doesn't it? Well, <clears throat> I don't need to sell any of you here that Satan's main modus operandi is deceit. And he works through any human beings who are willing to be used. And who claims that anybody who claims to be a prophet or a Christ, uh, even though the reality they're false prophets or false Christ, the devil does, is very happy to use people like that. He doesn't have any problem with that. Well, but the truth, of course, is that the devil was thrown out of heaven. And we know that eventually he'll be thrown where else? Lake of fire. Into the lake of fire after he's thrown into the dungeon and kept for a thousand years. So he's not the powerful guy he claims to be. His final deception, of course, for human beings here on this earth will be the time when, just before the second coming of Jesus, he appears claiming to be Jesus himself, working miracles, etc. How will we 
be able to protect ourselves and be able to survive with the devil himself, you know, standing in front of us, claiming to be Jesus Christ. Uh, we'll know because we know him. He who seeks to the will of the Father will know. Do the will of the Father will know of the teaching, whether I speak of myself. Or, so there's a sense of knowing a resonance mm -hmm. that if we're seeking so, to, do, to, to do God's will, that we will. So what you're it. saying, if we listen to him for a little while, we'll be able to tell by what he says. Yeah. Okay, Satan has clearly used two huge deceptions that we need to talk about. Which is the first one in, in scripture that you can think about? Huge you shall, deception. You shall not surely die. I mean, he barely opens his mouth and he's accusing God of being a liar. Look at Genesis 3. Now the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. The snake asked the woman, and remember God had said just before this, you know, if you eat of the tree you will die. So the snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? He's sort of implying that God doesn't want you to eat from any of those trees. We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, e except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even to touch it. If we do, we will die. And I wonder why she didn't say, that tree which you're sitting in, you know. I, I, I would have thought that, anyway. Have you ever wondered what you would say if you were the one standing next to Eve when that exchange took place? The thing that I often wonder about is it says the snake was the most cunning animal. Yeah. I wonder what it actually did. Mrs. White says they had wings. Yeah. Well, what, the part we're focusing on right now is the snake replied, that's not true, you will not die. Right up there, I mean, like his sentence, second sentence out of his mouth is that God has lied to you. But up till that time, apparently there had been no death anywhere in the universe. And certainly no lies either. No. So, well, there was lies, but not on well, God. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, I guess that's, it can happen. That's, that's, that's how you got the, uh, excuse me, Revelation 12, 4. Yeah. Uh, the tail swept down the third. So, uh, Maybe they're all getting used to the lies. I don't know. Well, the, 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 the evil that's come out of that that affects us in our day is what? It's a, there's, immortality. Yeah. Immortality. The immortality of the soul. I mean, if you, if you can't die, you're not going to die, then what happens to you if you're a sinner and you're not following God's plan, you're not going to go to heaven? But you need a hell for them. Yeah. That's a very precious doctrine for fundraising and uh, maintaining the finances of churches. Yeah. So Satan gets us to ignore the story of creation. So he institutes what other great deception? Sunday sacredness. So because it's going, it takes the place of what? Sabbath. The seventh day Sabbath. And what is the seventh day Sabbath supposed to celebrate? Creation. 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 So and if you, freedom from, uh, from bondage also. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's two gr great errors that Satan likes to talk about. Gary, you want to talk about those? Sure. Through the two great errors, it, the Im immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions while the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to collapse hands with the Roman power, and under the influence of the threefold union, the country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights and consciousness. Wow, great controversy, 588. So the United States, she says, 
is going to be involved in supporting Rome and trampling on our personal rights. Wow. So these things are clearly spelled out in Scripture, and we don't, we don't need to guess. Um, so how popular are these ideas in the world today? Very popular. Yes, it's the general I, thought. I mean, how many, how many people don't believe these ideas? So do you think that the, uh, the, the concern over terrorism, Islamic, radical Islamic terrorism, is laying the foundation for this force that will be imposed on people? I mean, the, the laws, the, the uh, wire ta the, the taps, the intelligence uh, gathering and so on, do you think that's... I think that's part of a, a bigger picture. I think there's, I mean, it's just, what we see is going on in the world today is just beyond belief. I think to bring it closer to home, it's undermining our country right now as we sit here. Yeah. We've got Sharia law in several states already. There are two people on the Supreme Court who shall remain nameless. Don't see anything wrong with this. Fortunately, the senior ones says they didn't vote for it. Sharia law. He's sticking to the, to the, uh, yeah. the, the main nitty gritty of the whole thing. It's being torn apart everywhere. Well, there are passages in the Bible that also speak very clearly, not just to um, the seventy sacredness thing, but what about the nature of man, the state of the dead? Can you think of some passages? One of the famous ones that we've learned, I can remember learning this when I was a young kid, Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 6 and verse 10. Yes, the living know they're going to die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward. They are completely forgotten. Their loves, their hates, their passions all die with them. They will never again take part in anything that happens in this world. And then if you drop down to verse 10, so we're critics, cri those who criticize your point of view say, Oh, Solomon was just depressed at that yeah. time. Yeah. Well, work hard at whatever you do because there will be no action, no thought, no knowledge, no wisdom in the world of the dead, and that's where you're going. You can say Solomon was just depressed, but uh, would God allow, would God preserve this book and have Solomon write it, included in Scripture, if that was not true? Jim, I thought you were going to talk about all the falsehoods in, in the book of Job. I almost started saying it. <laughs> well, the book, that's a, a topic I'd love to get into because, uh, uh, you know, how many times have we been over the book of Job in the last, uh, what, 25 years? Yeah. And uh, at the end of the, chapter 42, God says, you're not telling the truth about, about me. Huh? Septuagint, you haven't even told the truth about uh, Job. Well, what are those lies? Yeah. And we haven't even figured that out and yet. We have a Bible study guide t two times in the last 25, they're about 25 years, and they quote passages from Eliphaz and uh, what, Bildad and Shuhat. Zophar and, and Elihu, as though there's something good there. Yeah. Now Jesus said, or God says that there's, you're lying. They're lying. Uh, what are the lies? Well, fortunately, we don't have to depend upon just on Ecclesiastes. Look at Psalm 115, verse 17. The Lord is not praised by the dead, by any who go down to the land of silence. And Psalm 146, verse 4. When they die, they return to the dust, and all that, on, on that day, all their plans come to an end. Even the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 to 18. For the, if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. So... There's no reason to be raised unless you're in the grave. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is a delusion and you are still lost in your sins. It would also mean that the believers in Christ who have died are lost. If our hope in Christ is good for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in the world, in all the world. He's pretty blunt about that. Um, so it's not just Ecclesiastes that uh, talks about the nature of man. These passages make it very clear that when we die, our loves, our hates, our pass passions die with us. There's no knowledge in the grave. All our plans end. More than that, if men go to heaven or hell immediately upon death, then the resurrection of Christ becomes a falsehood. 
He should never have been actually dead. I mean, if humans are trans, somehow is the, the soul escapes from the body and goes off to heaven, then where was Jesus during those days when he is, quote, in the grave? He's in heaven. So Why would he need to be raised? Why would he need to be raised? Exactly. No point. Why would he say on Sunday morning that I haven't yet ascended to my father? Lots of contradictions there, aren't there? Mm. Well, there are some places that talk in the Bible that talk about resurrection. Look at Daniel 12, verse 2, for example. Many of those who have already died will live again. Some will enjoy eternal life and, no, and some will suffer eternal disgrace. Well, if there's no dying, why do you need to live again? No, really dying. Uh, look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Our brothers and sisters, we want you to know the truth about those who have died. Now that should be a clear passage, right? So that you will not be sad as are those who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will take back with Jesus those who have died believing in him. What we are teaching you now is the Lord's teaching. We, are, we who are alive on the day the Lord comes will not go ahead of those who have died. There will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. So if they're already in heaven, what's with this rising to life? You'd have to bring them back, wouldn't he? Then we who are living at that time will gather, be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord, and so then encourage one another with these words. And... Uh, we don't quote those, those words very often in some circles. John 5, 38 and 39. I mean, sorry, 28 and 29. Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead will hear his voice and come out of their graves, not come down from heaven or come up from hell. Come out of their graves. Those who have done good will rise and live, and those who have done evil will rise and be condemned. By the way, this is an interesting proof of the idea that we've talked about on some occasions that uh, the early writers, even John in his early, I mean, this is John in his earlier life, didn't know anything about a, a, a millennium. He thought, okay, there's going to be a resurrection, some are going to live and some are going to die. Well, we know now that there's going to be a thousand years between those two events. Okay, well, one of the great recent expansions on Satan's lies are teachings about near-death experiences. What do you know about near-death experiences? Nothing personal. Yeah, Thank <laughs> fortunately, nothing personal, right. No. I've heard that it's kind of a lack of oxygen, similar to uh, they can do the with, uh, with those space or experiments for space. Mm -hmm. you know, the blood it runs, it rushes away from the brain and uh, you can get a similar thing. You can see, basically a type of hallucination, I guess. Mm -hmm. but, uh, when my father was in his 40s, he had Guillain-Barre syndrome and was mm -hmm. ventilator dependent for weeks, unable to breathe. And his tracheostomy tube in the very early days of tracheostomies mm -hmm. uh, got plugged up. Oh, and he became, for a short time, hypoxic, went unconscious. He says he woke up with a horrible headache and, mm -hmm. you know, no, no lights, no experiencing God, no looking, looking uh, down on himself, nothing of that sort, just horrible headache. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that there are a lot of people who have been resuscitated, who basically were dead if they, if they were left alone. They would be dead, but have been resuscitated by the fancy techniques that we know about now and the life-saving machines we have, etc. But there are people who claim that they see themselves, they're up there floating in the sky and they're looking or on the, up against the ceiling and they're looking down on themselves or some of them say, well, they even see Jesus and others say, well, I, I saw a relative who passed away. Where do those stories come from? Preconditioning. Yeah. Those are ideas that they have in their mind that they're thinking, okay, this is what's going to happen. And so when the oxygen level goes, drops down in their brain, they, those things start to, to come out. Well, um, the brain is inclined to think crazy things under those circumstances. We know that all such experiences are directly opposed to the truth as taught in Scripture. So when somebody 
when a doctor says, well, this person was dead for a certain amount of minutes, how do they know that? Is it just that the heart quit beating? The heart quit beating. So or they stopped breathing. Dead. They s stopped breathing, heart quit beating, mm -hmm. and that's death, even no. though all the In cells are still working. Some definitions, yes. Hmm. Well, another great deception which has been foisted upon us in relatively recent times is the idea of evolution. And you can see that Satan had a hard time trying to convince people that we didn't need God so long as the only explanation for our origins was God. And that was true until about 1859. That's not that far along, that, that long ago. And what happened in 1859? Well, Actually, it was before that. In 1844, Darwin wrote his book, and then he didn't. He had a lot of doubts about it. He didn't bother to, to, to print his or publish his book until 1859, when somebody else was about to publish something like that. And he says, "Well, I got to get hold. Got to get ahead of the, the curve here." And so he published his book. Well, great controversy was first done in 1859. The first great controversy vision, 18, 1858. Excuse 57, me. 57, actually. Was it? Yeah. Well. Um, and then, of course, republished after that. But well, there's a lot of things happened back there that with the Pope yeah. and the infallibly the Pope and uh, 1870. Yeah, all that stuff. Well, of course, the whole idea of evolution is contradicted by the very plain statements in the Bible in Genesis 1 to 11. So, what happens to Genesis 1 to 11? Mythology, spiritualized away. Contradictions. Now. When we call them, they, many of our Christian friends would call those first 11 chapters of, of Genesis myth. What do they mean when they say myth? It's not true. Yeah. What they mean. Well, it, <laughs> they would say myth, myth, is, myth is a story about gods and things up there that you, you, we, can't, we can never know for sure. So they're not just outright saying it's a lie. They're saying you can't really know. Good folk tale. Mm-hmm. Well, scientifically, we do know that there are small changes that take place in various organisms, all the way from single cells to human beings, that lead to some changes, some small changes. But this does not mean that eventually, uh, you know, uh, reptiles are going to become birds and birds are going to become mammals. It's never going to happen, no matter how many billions of years you have. But the pitch is that they don't, they don't like the term microevolution and macroevolution because they see it as a continuum. Because it sort of creates a, a question, a distinction. They want to see it as one... Of course, of course they do. Uh, yeah. One thread. But they don't have any... They, they can't produce a single example of macroevolution that they can prove. Here is a lizard that became a bird um, or something like that, that you can actually prove that or, or in modern terms actually pr produce it. Well, and you, you know, they'll say that you need three billion years for all of this to happen, and yet more and more we're finding evidence that it, uh, things couldn't have been that long. You've got uh, the soft tissue in dinosaurs that are supposedly 70 million years old or so, and uh, that contradicts uh, other science, and then also uh, car carbon-14. Yeah. and dinosaur bones and coal and even diamonds. So a diamond is not going to get contaminated. They, they would try to say that it, the others were just contaminated because that's kind of the magic wand that gets rid of any date that doesn't seem to fit what they want. It must be contaminated. Well, the point clearly is that if you believe in evolution, then there's no reason to celebrate the Sabbath, is there? Well, in order to be as clever a counterfeiter as possible, one person needs to be able to recreate an image that looks very much like the original that you're trying to copy. So what does Satan done? I'll look at a few passages here. Um, Revelation 12, 17. The dragon was furious woman and went off to the fight against the rest of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to truth revealed by Jesus. Okay, we want to put that alongside Revelation 13, 1 to 7. I really don't have time to read the whole chapter. A beast comes up out of the sea. It has ten horns and seven heads, and each of its horns is wearing a crown, and each of its heads, there was a name that was insulting God, etc. 
And if we look at this, what do we find? We find that there are three creatures here. There's the dragon. There's the first beast, or the, sea, the beast that comes up out of the sea. And there's the land beast. And what do, we, what do we know about these beasts? Well, first of all, the dragon and the sea beast um, look almost exactly alike. I mean, seven heads, ten horns, etc. I don't know how much more similarity you need than that. And then there's the land beast. There. What? There can't be a lot of those out there. <laughs> can't be a lot of those out there. No, that's for sure. Um, so we can see in Revelation 12, we have the positive identification of the dragon as being who? Satan himself. Then yeah. we see this dragon producing a beast which comes up out of the sea. Based on Revelation 17, 15, we believe that a beast coming up out of the sea means that it arises among nations and peoples in well-populated areas. Satan has always wanted to take the place of the father, and so ex exercising his power, the dragon is a fit counterfeit for the father. So what do the other beasts represent? Well, what are the characteristics of the sea beasts which he created? Look at Revelation 13, verses 2 to 5. The beast looked like a leopard with feet like a bear's feet and a mouth like a lion's mouth. The dragon gave the beast his own power, his throne, and his vast authority. So where does the sea beast's power and authority come from? Dragon. And let us remind ourselves the dragon is whom? Satan. Satan. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast that had been healed, and so forth and so forth. So... Who else in the, in, in the, we know about in history um, was, received his power from God, died, and came back to life again? Jesus. Jesus, obviously. So here this sea beast is intentionally a copy of Jesus. Furthermore, the sea beast re received the deadly wound, as we mentioned, and uh, he's given power for how long a period of time? Three and a half prophetic years. Okay, how long was Jesus' ministry here on this earth? Three literal years. Three and a half literal years, right? Well, then there's that other beast, Revelation thirteen eleven through seventeen, it's described as coming up out of the earth. It has, uh, if in a, obviously if it's coming up out of the earth, that means it's, it didn't come up out of the water, so it didn't come up. It grew up in an area where the the Population was non-existent or very sparse. Um, it rises up looking like a lamb. Guess whom that reminds us of, of? And it ends up speaking like a dragon. So here's something that someone that wants to look like Jesus, but he speaks like dragon. Satan, right? Then we find that this land beast promotes the interests of the sea beast and ultimately of the dragon itself, just as the Holy Spirit glorifies not himself but Jesus and the Father. So now we have a, a trinity. Okay, so Gordon, I think you've got something to add to that. This is from uh, John Pauline, as quoted in the uh, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. At the end of the land, at the end, the land beast performs a counterfeit of Pentecost. For what purpose? To prove to the world that the counterfeit trinity is the true God. How many people have even thought about the possibility that Satan could have his own trinity? Well, the father of lies, son of perdition, yeah. and the spirit of evil. <laughs> there you go. Just like that. A nice small package. You can carry that around. <laughs> Easy to remember. So we have seen that Satan has promulgated his deceptions through teaching about the immortality of the soul, leading to the awful teaching of an eternally burning hell, Sunday sacredness, leading to the evolution and the rejection of the six-day creation week celebrated by the seventh-day Sabbath, and follows up these deceptions with false Christs and false prophets. That's a pretty comprehensive package, wouldn't you say? It's good enough to deceive most of the world. Yeah. Well, we've already mentioned this, but let's just review it again. When did Charles Darwin write his book? 1844. And that followed what journey that he, took, he went on? 
Galapagos Islands. We travel on in the Beagle. Beagle. The Beagle, and one of the places they stopped was the Galapagos Islands, and he saw those birds with different sizes of beaks, and he thought, aha, here we have it. So because two birds have different sizes of beak, that's proof that a dragon can become a bird, right? Well, maybe not. Well, um, it is too bad that Darwin didn't know and recognize these words from Ellen White. Myra? Although the earth was blighted with a curse, nature was still man's lesson book. It could not now represent goodness only, for evil was everywhere present, marring the earth, the sea, the air with its defiling touch. Where once was written only the character of God, the knowledge of good, was now written also the character of Satan, the knowledge of evil. From nature, which now <coughs> revealed the knowledge of good and evil, man was continually to receive warning as to the results of sin. Okay, so that's Ellen White, The Book of Education, page 26, paragraph 2, and some other places. So the question, are we as Seventh-day Adventists prepared to give a clear and convincing argument against Darwinian evolution? Do we have the scientific evidence? Do we have the biblical evidence? Think you can do that? You out there, do you think you can do that? I can give evidence of my faith, whether that mm -hmm. convinces anyone else is another matter. Because people Yeah, but we want our we want our arguments to be as forceful as good as possible. Mm -hmm. A man convinced against as well as of the pain. Yeah, well, still. we have so, to recognize that. And truth. we're not use, trying to use force, no. you know, or the force of our personality. You know, screaming at them and yelling at them is not going to change yeah. them. Yeah. On so. the other hand, we want to have as much evidence as we can that's on our side, because they're going to come up with all kinds of ideas on their side. But we have to give them a choice. In other words, mm -hmm. this is this is what I believe. These are the questions that I have. And if they're willing to make a choice, then they could move over instead of just yeah. trying to rip it out of their so hands. So, you out there, and I'll ask the group here as well, why do so many Christians reject the idea of a literal Satan? Well, it depends on what continent you're on, isn't it? <laughs> I suppose, partly, yeah. Well, Seems I'm like high technology continents don't believe in him, but the ones that um, are more of a culture where it's less science, they seem to see him. Well, you, yeah, if you're scientific and you're looking for natural causes, then any kind of supernatural thing is, is something you don't really want to be associated with, unless you're making a, a frightening movie. Yeah. Then you well, well, science, science is pretty material. Yeah. It's very material. We worship God in spirit, and um, well, science me, doesn't really hold on to the spirit yeah. at all. Let me give you a challenge. You're a physician working in the hospital over here, and you've just helped to resuscitate somebody who's had a near-death experience. And you come, and they're, they're not in any position to be discussing anything very serious at that point, but you come back the next day, let's say, and the person is sitting up in bed. You sit down, and now you're going to convince them that near-death experiences aren't real. How are you going to do that? That he, he does what? He sees this stuff? I mean, I've heard of people who take drugs can see spiders crawling all over everything, and, yeah. and I mean, they're real. Mm -hmm. And um, so, who knows what happens when your body is doesn't have a lot of oxygen or whatever. Years ago, people would go into sensory deprivation tanks where they just mm -hmm. float in the water and they have their air and stuff. And it's almost like the mind has to have something to respond to, so it creates something. So they would hallucinate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, but what do you say to these people? Do you say anything? Probably right there at that point in time, it's um, 
I would probably start off by asking them what was their experience. Yeah. And just you got to probe, probe a bit about their background. Mm -hmm. Gives you a bit of a clue so you're not going in totally cold. Yeah. <coughs> well, let's not forget the verse we read earlier. Well, no wonder even Satan can disguise himself to look like an angel of light. And we're talking about the master deceiver. I mean, every once in a while they have a program on television about uh, people who do magic or de deceivers of various kinds. And some of the stuff they can do is just unbelievable. And if, that, if human beings can do that, what can the devil do? <coughs> Excuse me. So how successful has Satan been at spreading out his false ideas? Pretty successful. Right. It's an ongoing concern. It's working well for him. <coughs> Ellen White tells us that he thought at one time that he might actually be able to win all of the angels to his side. And now I'm sure he's thinking, I'm getting close to winning everybody on planet Earth to my side. I'm sure he's thinking like that. Well, Satan obviously does not have the truth on his side. So what kind of methods does he use? He uses excitement, he uses emotional appeals. He doesn't want you to sit down quietly and investigate the facts about anything. He says, just feel it, feel it yourself. So we need to study very carefully and make sure we know the truth. Jim, I think you've got something on that. God never asks us <laughs> without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence his character, the truthfulness of his word, are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason. And this testimony is abundant. Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. Ellen White, The Steps to Christ, page 105. So if you had a Christian friend who asked you um, for the evidence that Satan is literal, a literal being, could you produce it? Satan's claims that we are naturally immortal just are just passed from one existence, or, or just, just pass from one, we just pass from one existence to, into another existence has led, of course, to the ideas of the immortality of the soul and an eternally burning hell. To buttress his arguments, he has managed to convince many through the ideas of evolution to set, a God, set aside God's claims as our creator. For those who choose to believe in scripture, Satan has produced his own trinity, the dragon, the sea beast, and the land beast. We've already talked about. Think of what is happening in our world today. Excitement and fanaticism are popular trends, but we have been warned. Gary, you want to look at that? Yes, there is a constant danger of allowing something to come into our midst that we may regard as the workings of the Holy Spirit, but that in reality is the fruit of a spirit of fanaticism. So long as we allow the enemy of truth to lead us into a wrong way, we cannot hope to reach the honest in heart with the third angel's message. We are to be sanctified through the obedience of, to the truth. I'm afraid of anything that would have a tendency to turn the mind away from the solid evidences of the truth as revealed in God's Word. I'm afraid of it. I'm afraid of it. We must bring our minds within the bounds of reason, lest the enemy so come in as to set everything in a disorderly way. There are persons of an excitable temperament who are easily led into fanaticism. And should we allow anything to come into our churches that would lead such persons into error, we would soon see these errors carried to extreme lengths, and then because of the course of these disorderly elements, a stigma would rest upon the whole body of Seventh-day Adventists. And that's from Selected Messages, Book 2. Well, so we've been warned about Satan's deceptions, haven't we? We need to have our feet solidly planted on the truth. Our only safety is in knowing in Bible truth. And 
What do we? What does the Bible tell us about our battle with with the de with evil? Dennis, Ephesians six twelve through sixteen. For we are not for we are not fighting against human beings, but against the wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world, the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers of this dark age. So put on God's armor now. Then when the evil day comes, you will be able to resist the enemy's attacks. And after fighting to the end, you will still hold your ground. So stand ready with truth as a belt around your waist, with righteousness as your breastplate, and as your shoes, and as your shoes the readiness to announce the good news of peace. At all times carry faith as a shield, for with with it you will be able to put out all the burning arrows shot by the evil one, and accept salvation as a helmet, the word of God as the sword which the Spirit gives you. Good news okay. translation. So if you have truth, righteousness, readiness to announce the good news, faith, salvation, the word of God, you would be pretty well set for your battles for the seven, with the devil, right? Now we can have a couple of sessions on each one of those. Yeah, exactly. Mm. But the, well, it's always a defensive position to stand firm. It's not like we have to gain the ground. Christ has already gained the ground for us and we defend ourselves uh, uh, by his, uh, the Lord's armor. Yeah, but we do have an offensive weapon. It's called the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's called the sword. Well, from the beginning of his rebellion in heaven, Satan's ultimate goal has, to, has been to put himself in God's place and get as many people as possible to worship him. I mean, it just blows me away to think that he tried to get Jesus to worship him. How do he they worship him right now? Well, you tell me. No, I'm asking you. <laughs> okay. Well... So what does worship mean? It means the Worth. value. Worthship has it value. It means worship. It means you consider something of ultimate value. So if you were to walk out here, go down to Los Angeles, something like this, and you stop people on the street and you say, what do you think is the most important thing in your life? What would they say? What do you think is most important in your life? Family. Well, some would say that, yeah. <laughs> Money. Money. Okay. Power. Power. Influence. Flat fame, influence, yeah. So if you value everything, anything above God, you're worshiping Satan? It's about right. Well, Jesus came to do the will of the Father, and Satan's uh, basic, well, it, if we go back to the very first quotation we had, um, <laughs> that the angels should obey the dictates of their own will. Mm -hmm. If you look at Luciferianism, that's the basic tenet is do thine own will. Mm -hmm. And so if you, when you see that played out in so many ways in our society, mm -hmm. this is what I want and it's getting to the point where you can't even debate <laughs> or, or raise questions. Somebody was uh, questioned the, the professor at a uh, University in Illinois and got kicked out of class for not being able to uh, toe the mark. Really? John 18, 37, Jesus says when he's talking to Pilate, what, what was your mission? He says, I'm here to tell the truth or bear witness yeah. to the truth. It's that, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. yeah. The truth is about God, which will set you free. Well, Satan, as in the last thousands of years, has had just this world to focus on and to really, truly try to deceive us. And his theology is amazing. Uh, I wonder how many people have any idea of all the, the devices he's used. We have, I, I one time put together some accusations that Satan made against God from various sources, from inspired sources, and I thought maybe we could read a couple of those. Um, Dennis, I think, no, or was it Gary? Somebody can read faster <laughs> than yeah. me. Well, I'll read it. It okay. was Satan who originated the doctrine of eternal torment and eternally burning hell. 
based on his doctrine of the immortality of the soul. It was Satan's hope that men believing these misrepresentations would come to, to regard this eternal torment as God's punishment for sin. The appalling views of God that would result would lead millions into skepticism, infidelity, atheism, rebellion, and even universalism. Fear of punishment and misunderstanding of God's justice would eventually dethrone human reason. Satan represents God as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary, one who plunges all those into hell who do not please him. While sinners are thought to suffer unutterable anguish and flames, he, God, is represented as looking down upon them with satisfaction as they eternally feel his wrath or vengeance. Um, the whole field of religion is thought of as being totally irrational, even repugnant, because people cannot logically understand how God could be by nature love, and at the same time for the sins of a brief earthly life, they are to suffer torture as long as God shall live. It would be against his character, benevolence, and love to plunge into eternal torments the beings whom he has created. And if you want to see where all those quotations came from, you can get the handout from our, our website, www theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and look for the final end of Sin and Sinners, and you'll see all the references there. So if you want to find where, as I already mentioned, well, look at, look at a couple of places. Revelation 12, 9, the huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, that deceived the whole world, he was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. So is there any question in anybody's mind who this dragon is? I hope not. And what's going to happen to this dragon? Look at verse 20, chapter 20, verse 10. Then the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had already been thrown. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So we wish we had time. We'd explain all those expressions. But the point is, do we want to join the devil's side or do we want to go join God's side? It's as simple as that. It uh, may not be easy. The devil is there doing everything possible to deceive us, but we must not allow him to do it. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the truth revealed so plainly and clearly in your word. We thank you for giving us your word. May we now take it seriously so that we will not be deceived is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.